Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. Um, special evening today. I like this concept of the uh, quick, uh, quickly arranged event. Uh, gives you no time to think. You just turn up and uh, follow the market, follow the stock that you you like. Whether it's uh, URU Metals or Uru Metals, um, I'm delighted to present uh, John Zorbas, who's the CEO of the company. Uh, it's got many different investment angles: nickel, lithium, uh, management resource solutions as well. Uh, he'll explain to you the rationale behind his investment strategy and also uh, we'll find out why this is one of the most followed and most uh, currently the most loved stocks on the uh, London market. Over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, let's try the mic. No? Okay, so we'll go without the mic for now. Let's try it again. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to come out and see us uh, on such short notice. It, I look forward to uh, speaking to you, to everyone individually after the event. Maybe you'll have some Q&A that we can go through. Uh, now for us at URU or URU, as many people refer the company, it's exciting times. We've uh, gone through as we'll call it, the boom and the bust of the mining industry, and it kind of looks like, in whole, we paced, we paced ourselves, we starved ourselves the last three, four years, and uh, we had the company on life support in a way. Us largest shareholders and key people st stuck around. Leanne has been with us uh, from day one. Alex as well as a consultant, myself as a shareholder, and then after his management. And uh, fortunately enough, we're back, back, we're back to where everybody's looking at the mining industry again. And there's a big reason for it. Nickel is a commodity that we have 1.5 billion tons of ore. And out of that ore, 2.2, 0.3 is nickel content. We'll get into that a little bit more deeper uh, as we go along through this. So in saying that, this, the global demand for nickel has been increasing over the years. And we find ourselves in a position that even the majors that were not looking at companies at our, at our level are, we're back in their microscope. And with that, our Shareholders, you guys in here, which is another valuable asset that the company has that is not on the balance sheet. Uh, the reason why I say that, I get, oh, I want to find out who's the individual that passed my mobile number out. Because I'm getting a million texts a day. <laughs> What's up, text? Uh, and, and my email address. You guys, you guys have filled my box up. <laughs> and that's why my voicemail is full. That's why I don't have time to answer everyone, and I've chosen not to, except for Pat, that's moving to South Africa. He's over there. And he's going to be visiting Liana shortly, I guess, as well. Um, so th I consider you guys, despite the fact that you're painful to deal with, another asset for the company. We're OK. Does everybody hear me? Okay. So. Now, to get back into why the essence, why you guys are all here, we'll start off very slowly. And we'll take some Q&A after. Uh, we'll keep the forum pretty much open. So <clears throat> as we can see, well, you guys probably know the stock chart better than me. I don't follow, the st I don't follow our share price on a day-to-day -day level. The reason being is I'm looking at long-term value for Thank you. There we are. Here we are. Reason why I don't look at this on a day-to-day -day or weekly is I'm looking to build shareholder value for the long term. You know, up, down, on a daily basis or on a weekly basis is important to you know, the guys that are day traders. As a company, we're looking to build value long term. And we still see at these prices our assets are way undervalued. It's a little louder than I thought. Uh, so as, as significant as many people think this is, for me it's important, but the underlying importance for the company is 
what we're doing on a weekly, monthly basis. At these levels, I think we'll continue and grow. And I still believe that the company is way over, is, is extremely undervalued. Here you have the board. Uh, myself as CEO, I'm also a director, David Sabotic and Jay Vieira, with Henry Kloper joining us recently. Uh, he, Henry's also had a long history in the mining, resource, and banking industry. And uh, recently he's also exited from one of his lithium investments and he will, he's focused on, m mostly focused on a company that's related to, and to URU or URU, NWT Uranium. And NWT is actually transitioning to becoming a merchant bank for mining resource companies. On the balance of the board, I'll let you guys, I'm pretty sure everybody's gone through their CVs on the internet and also on our website. And I'll let you, I'll skip to that. The most important aspect for, our, for us is our technical team. Here, tonight we have Alexander Dementev with us and Liana Spy. Uh, Liana is on the ground in South Africa by the project. Alexander is located in the office in Toronto and he works mostly on the technical aspects of the project and Liana on the geology. Very shortly they'll take over. You'll, you'll want to hear from them more than me. So global demand on nickel, as everybody has been uh, seeing lately, is on the rise with the demand. And I'm actually going to let Alex jump in over here. He's a little more familiar with why is happening from not the market part, but from the commodity, the actual product. So I'll introduce you everybody, Alexander Dementev. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, a few words about uh, nickel as a uh, strategic material. First of all, <coughs> all military application needs nickel. That's why right now China uh, is the biggest buyer of the nickel. Take a look. So, that's shortfall uh, for the nickel. And China is buying uh, almost every uh, molecule of nickel worldwide and as the market is growing uh, for 2017 is going to be uh, at least 25 percent uh, more than uh, last year and again that's just because of uh, space technologies uh, <coughs> military technologies and right now nickel is going to be a very valuable commodity for the healthcare. So our project, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've held this project for quite a bit. We were fortunate enough, our, our initial technical team and also, share, and also management, were picked this up when nobody was looking. I referred to Zambadilia as the needle in the haystack historically, and it truly is a needle in the haystack. Uh, we've completed a PEA on the project in 2012 and the, the PEA at the time was quite favorable and if we didn't run into the economic, economic period where the mining industry, as everybody knows, went through its slump, this project would have probably had proceeded and either been in production by now or we would have JV'd with a major on, on it. Uh, a lot of reasons. Besides the mineralization and the, the overview, it has other favorable, uh, other favorable aspects to it. One, it's being its location and infrastructure. We have rail lines, a rail line that runs right through the property and it goes to a smelter. We have power on the we have power on the project, which is very, uh, power right on our property, which is very important. And we're also, we're also very close to the highway if we need to transport the ore out. Now, another thing that many people might have not picked up is we're very, very, very close to one of the largest open pit platinum, platinum, nickel, and copper mines. And I'll mention another gentleman's name, Mr. Friedland. 
We're right next door to Ivan Platt's project. I don't know if anybody's been following Mr. Friedland's uh, developing project over there, but uh, if you look at Ivan Platt's market cap and our neighbor's market cap to our market cap, you'll see there's a little bit of a difference. And uh, we're in the right neighborhood. One thing with mining and uh, in mining exploration is when you go for hunting for elephants, you need, to go to, you need to go to Elephant County. And we're right there. We're right smack in the middle of Elephant County. Now, this slide here will show you guys who are the top 10 nickel producers in the world. So, I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with them, but I'm gonna, I, I'd like you guys to take a look at the bottom, on the bottom of the list, number 10, 9, and 8, where they have nickel production, 30, 35, and 48, and 48. And look right on the bottom of it, you've got Zimbadilia, or the mini project. And I will let Liana get to you why we refer to Zimbadilia as the mini project shortly. If you really look at this slide and you take a look at Zimbadilia 25, if one of the bottom on the list picked it up, where would it move them on the rankings? Or you go to BHP. If they picked it up, they're right there with Extrata. So the company has many options and it can, and if we choose down the road to open ourselves up to JVs or other partnerships, we're in that top 10 group. There is no other project that has these economics or this value to, uh, a value to it. There's no comparable comp to that. This is where it gets complicated. This is the part that I'm not gonna try to explain to you very, because I'll probably pronounce something incorrectly and uh, these two over here will be quite upset with me. So I'll pass the mic over to Liana. Thank you, good evening. It's not really that complicated. Basically what um, John said is, the metal is in the earth, and that's the important part. Uh, if you look there, this is one of our um, cross sections, down dip, and the way you see this section, we can trace this on the mini project, for two and a half kilometers, and it looks exactly like that. You've got the two, the darker pink zones, which is the high grade zones, which is separated by a slightly lower. I mean, we don't really call it lower because it is like, um, if I read there, the one is point, that the pink is point, uh, point 0.3% nickel, and the lighter, um, part is point, uh, I think it's point two, two five. So there's not that big a difference between them. But the most import important part here is the continuity. From a geology perspective, um, once you start, um, once you start following these um, minerals in the ground, once you start talking about mining and mining costs, continuity becomes very important. And on this project, if, if you follow Black Reef geology, um, we don't often get this in the Black Reef. This is really um, stunning geology for the Black Reef. Um, then if you look at the mineral deposit, uh, it consists of that, like I said, continuous disseminated um, nickel mineralization. Um, and we've got large thicknesses, over 250 meters thick of this sulfide zone um, and an overlying 40 meter thick magnetite rich zone. Now the magnetite rich zone is a new aspect of this project. Um, we've been focusing on the nickel and um, yeah, the magnetite is, is basically a, um, at this stage we see it as a byproduct, but it has the potential to become even bigger than the nickel, um, we're just sort of in the beginning phases of starting the exploration on it, but we'll show you a little bit later um, on. Okay, 
In this slide, uh, you can see the sulfide zone, the in situ indicated mineral resources. Um, we've got the. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. So our eyesight. Uh, our, <laughs> it's our, glaring. It's <laughs> glaring in here, so you can't really see this screen. You have to look over there, and that's a little glaring, so sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we've got the mineral deportment study. Um, which has shown a 62% of the nickel contained in sulfides and therefore potentially recoverable. Um, and furthermore, the average ratio of the asset nickel to total nickel throughout the sulfide zone is 58%. Now, um, we are currently busy with metallurgical studies because when we do assays with the, with the asset leach, we get a 90% recovery. So that's why we are currently looking at doing further metallurgical test work and I'm sure we're going to be able to, in the next, the next time we see you, be able to report even better recoveries than these. Um, and 62% is already uh, quite high for these type of um, deposits. Okay. Um, this slide has, uh, is showing the um, expansion potential of the project. Um, this is basically the area, the, the green area is the area that we've currently drilled. And you can see that in this bottom area here, there's still a large potential that haven't been explored. Uh, the current project economics only include revenue of nickel in the indicated resource category. Uh, I think the figures there is um, 485.4 million tons at 0.245% nickel. Then inferred resources are currently stated at 1.115 million tons at 0.248% nickel. And then the ore body has not been drilled, tested along strike. Uh, we will do some infill drilling shortly. We are planning to start a drill program in the next, um, well, as soon as I yeah. get back to South Africa, basically. <laughs> and then, um, okay, then there are six ways to expand this project. Okay. You, oh, okay, so yeah, I'll take You want to take that? Well, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, that's uh, for me. Wait, it's okay. You okay. can go on. I was going gonna to jump there for you. So okay, go on. it doesn't matter. Okay, so we, we want to upgrade the inferred resort. We want to do the lateral drilling, that's the infill drilling, increase the pit depth, uh, iron concrete uh, concentrate from magnetite, which I touched on, and then improve nickel recoveries. This, that's part of the metallurgy. And then there is a bit of uh, a PGE mineralization along the football contact. That is a pseudo plat reef, which is essentially the same as what um, Ivanhoe is looking at, and um, the same as what is mined at the Makalakwena mine. Both those are adjoining properties, pretty much. Are, we're in the right neighborhood for elephant hunting. OK. So um, this is a uh, cross section. Through, um, it's basically the same section I showed you previously. If you look at this um, section here, you can see it's basically ultra mafic um, rock types, peroxenites, hartsburgites, danites. Um, and then the, the, the orange is the nickel parts per million. Um, but essentially, you can see it's mineralized throughout, it's, it's very large thicknesses. And it is a very continuous mineralization um, on this project. And the way it looks like this in this section, that's pretty much what you find in every hole that you drill. If you look at the cross section, uh, across the screen on that side, you can see the ore body is really nicely compacted. And um, there's, there, there, there's no outliers or anomalies. It, what you drill, what you, what you plan on is normally you can predict it. After about three or four holes, we started to um, predict the geology in our drill planning for, for, for the next holes. And every time we hit the mark, there was nothing that ever 
rock the boat or it's really very, very consistent. Okay, there is basically a summary of all the, 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 the upper ones is the historical U-holes and then the Z-holes or the Z-phase of the project was the latest holes. That was, that was when I came onto the project, that's when we started, it's from Z1. And um, if you look at the nickel percentage here, um, right by next to me, you can see that um, that it's it's really good. The, the grades. These are if you look at the at the intervals, it's staggering to think you've got 0 0.26, 0 0.7, 0 0.26. And if you look at the thicknesses, it's 521 meters, 162 meters. I mean, if you think there's people who who, who mine on two or three meters, you know, this is a massive, massive, massive ore body and it's all on the surface. Um, so it's just staggering the open cast potential and it's a pipeline body. So um, we're not even at this stage um, contemplating what's, you know, the deeper parts of the ore body. We're just touching the surface here. So the potential is really enormous here. Okay, this is a high finish nickel um, project. This is a um, parts per million nickel. We can see the we've got the, the the red and the orange and the yellow here, and that's just a block model, a, a very very basic block model um, to show the disseminated nature of the ore body um, and how it lends itself to an open pit. Okay. Now this is where it gets interesting for me and normally this is where I lose everybody in the talk. Um, but just very, very um, basic mineralogy. If you look at this, you can see the relationship between the peridotite, the pentlandite, which is normally the platinum carrying the peridotite, and which is the nickel, they, they associated PGE and nickel and copper um, sulfides and the magnetite sitting right next to it. So this is not a zoned ore body. This is all-inclusive. And the nice thing about it is you can actually, in metallurgy, extract them. It's, it's not going to clash. These things can simultaneously be mined. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. As I said, the one of our assets, uh, the company assets that nobody sees on the company's market cap or the balance sheet are our people like Liana. Liana has been with the project. That drill hole, the Z drill hole, she was there with the very first meter that was drilled and she was there at the very last meter and she's still with us. So that needs, geologists, when they fall in love with the project, there's a reason why. Uh, I think she touched it a little bit for you guys. Uh, however, I'll move on and I'll get into the technical aspect a little bit. We've a little bit, and so therefore, I'm going to introduce and bring back Alex, and Alex will try to explain things in a normal business-oriented way for a lot of people to understand. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, so, first of all, uh, now let me tell you that uh, I was lucky. Uh, to work with Narils Nickel in, uh, in my past. So uh, those type of deposit, this type of deposit is uh, remind us of uh, what uh, biggest nickel pro producer has. So it's very close to what they have up north in Russia. Uh, this uh, type of uh, project, it's not focused only on nickel, it has so many phases which uh, depends on the market value can be turned uh, into a even bigger assets than nickel. So uh, right here uh, I would like to uh, be back to previous slide uh, where we show mineralization. So that's block right in center. It means for us that we have not only nickel, we have copper, we have uh, platinum, all platinum group of metals, we have iron, we have so several different aspects of the uh, technology processing. 
and that's uh, our, on this slide it was recommended to us a uh, technological schema to work uh, with this project but uh, however uh, work with uh, analysis nickel uh, we able to uh, shift all our uh, technology to the new processing uh, ideology, I would say, where we focus uh, not only on a single process, on a single to, to, to extract only nickel, uh, we would be working on a leaching technology which would uh, allow us to extract a whole group of elements simultaneously. And that's our huge advantage. And here, uh, as uh, we said before, uh, luckily we have magnetite sitting on top of the deposit, and this one is giving us immediate revenue stream. So there's one thing that um, everybody's looked at our past economic models and um, and see the. IRR on the project, the return on investment, uh, and the time scales are taken. One thing that the PEA, the pre-economic assessment that the company completed, did not include was the magnetite. At the time, uh, we knew of it. We obviously saw it. Uh, however, the company focused on proving the, the feasibility of the project solely on the nickel and uh, be a base metal, a single base metal with byproducts, of course, uh, company. And therefore, there was a decision made at the time not to include it in the PEA. We disclosed it. Everybody knew of it. However, the numbers didn't incorporate that. Once we take these factors, w once we take these factors into consideration, the whole model changes, the whole PEA it, it improves drastically. And uh, Leanna will come here and talk a little bit about the magnetite resource, the potential magnetite resource that we're looking at. Okay, so um, from a bulk model analysis of the composite sample of the oxide zone material, um, this is the borehole Z05. That is pretty much in the center of the ore body. We chose that as representative. That's the one that I showed you the in the previous in slide, the previous slide where we had the nickel and you could see it was mineralized with nickel throughout. We choose that as well and did some testing for the magnetite. Uh, the numbers we got out of that um, during the PEA showed that the sample consisted of 15.34% magnetite by mass stripping of the oxide zone material required to it says the sulfide zone is in the order of 182 million tons and the estimated amount of magnetite present in the stripped material will be 27.3 million tons. Okay, so assuming uh, a very conservative recovery of 50%, the, be the potential amount of magnetite recoverable would be around about 13.7 million tons and this translates into an estimated value of recoverable magnetite um, of 1.5 billion US dollars uh, you can see the numbers there on the slide in the bracket which they used and thus the potential net revenue they've summarized for you here with the resource site at uh, 82, 182 million tons, magnetite grade is 15%, the assumed recovery I mentioned was 50, and then in the end, basically what you want to look at is the bottom line, and um, that's the one that you are interested in. <laughs> interested for all the shareholders, of course. So, this is, uh, I'd like to get here, this is the nickel production technology that we're looking at uh, when we get to that stage prior and after, prior to uh, production. Uh, as everybody can see, and I want to draw your focus on this, normally companies of this size, of our size, 
have not gone through have not gone through the studies and PEAs to get to be able to assess what we're what we're going to do in the future based on what we have today. Uh, we've really focused on being able to show an example to or show the marketplace what the potential and what the next steps are to move this project forward. And uh, having heard a lot of you, sh having heard a lot of the shareholders over phone calls and or text messages again, uh, kindly stop text messaging me. Uh, I'm going to ask Alex to to guide. The questions are what we would do. So I'm going to ask Alex here to explain this process, so the text messaging can stop. Uh, I'm not going to deep into the uh, technology. So, but what we are looking for as a company, as uh, John had mentioned, uh, <clears throat> we are not focusing only uh, today's needs, today's value of the company. We are always looking what we can do. Uh, to bring uh, new values to the company, uh, to implement uh, modern technologies. And uh, this one, this technology is a mix of uh, uh, innovation and traditional leaching technologies. So uh, we are processing uh, all or in the same, uh, in the same technological scheme, uh, but separating it uh, at the specific stage uh, by processing separately copper, uh, platinum metals, uh, iron, and nickel. So that's uh, technology uh, applied for Nariz nickel, and it's working uh, for almost uh, 100 years already. And it's very successful uh, approach, and we are bringing it here to our company to uh, to focus not only on a single uh, element, but we are processing ore as a uh, complex commodity. And this one, this slide is showing uh, our approach to uh, heap leaching. Uh, we are doing innovation as well. So uh, here. We are using uh, a leaching pad, and we are pumping air in it uh, in order to bring temperature up. So it would give us uh, additional benefits of uh, traditional leaching, and it could speed up uh, leaching process almost 100%. Uh, and this slide would show uh, that's additional innovation of our company. We are using heat exchangers uh, in the middle of process. That would allow us to save 50% uh, of uh, electrical power only by using uh, exchangers, heat exchangers. And what is uh, one of the very important aspects of our uh, technological development? Uh, it's uh, this part. You would see it here, it's like a blood. Some looks like a dirt, but actually that's extremely uh, valuable commodity. It's a ferro-vanadium. So we can extract it along our process. And this commodity uh, is uh, valuable. It's more valuable than nickel, cobalt, even though it's, uh, you can compare it with gold. So we're pretty much some, uh, we're trying to pack as much information for you guys uh, in a quick one hour uh, investor meeting. And uh, unfor so we're, just to sum it up, to bring everybody back into speed and in closing, and then we can get into any Q&A that you have, uh, I'd like to summary up that we are looking at a low-grade, high-tonnage, open-pit resource here. It's, uh, I'm going to go back to what Liana said. It's actually remarkable on how it's continuous. I, I don't think people understand when you say open-pit strike zone. We have a football field of open-pit nickel mining here. 
maybe double the size eventually when we, when we do some additional drilling. On top of that, we also have the upside that we have not taken into account in our PA. We've always kept that. Uh, it's been fully disclosed to everybody. We have the potential, the huge upside of the magnetite that has not been taken into account. Once we look at all those, the project economics exceed our expectations realistically. And we'll prove this as we go forward. We hear sometimes a lot of complaints from um, individual investors that saying, you're not updating the market, you're not doing this, you're not doing this. And I, I, at the beginning, I try to state it to everyone that we're not a one-day play. We're not a one-week play. We're looking to build something here that is going to take us from an exploration company in that top 10, or we'll take a top 10 to number four or five. That's our objective here. And alongside with that, with that thought and process, with that thinking and process, that's how we're trying to build value for our company and hence our shareholders. So coming back to it, when we look at it, and Alex went into various methods of extraction and processing. Some of you are going to wonder and you're going to say, oh, that seems all complicated. That's all confusing. It really isn't. We are just copying what the biggest guy in the industry is doing. They've been doing it very successful for a very long time. So we're just taking that approach and we're applying it to our little mini project in South Africa that has been sleeping for a long time, that needle in the haystack. In doing so, I think, and the, and the company thinks, that's why Liana from date was at drill hole number one, and she's going to be there for a very long time. Uh, Alex and myself, I've been a shareholder of URU from its formation. Uh, so I've been with URU for a very long time. Part of the uranium plays, those actually were my properties that went into your Niger uranium at the time. Um, so we're looking for the next 12 months for very exciting times for this company. The next couple of weeks uh, are going to give a very good indication on where we're going. And uh, we're moving a little slow for some people. But our interest is to, big, to build big shareholder value. We're not a day trader here. We're a company builder. And that's why the organization that we've put together suffered through the mining bust. And now we're going into the, I don't want to call it this, the mining boom. And saying that, this is where we are today. And uh, the floor is open for any Q&A that you guys might potentially have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Liana, Alex, thank you. Thank you, guys.